So turn with me in your Bibles first to uh, Mar- uh, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, a text I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a wonderful text, especially if you read the verses before and after it. We'll focus on verse 33. And also, I want to bring to your attention uh, a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's read, these two, let's read these two scriptures. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, But seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And then 1 Corinthians 13, 1. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. This is the Word of God. Now, um, I want to ask you a question. This is like uh, audience participation. So I want you to shout it out. Are you ready? You got, it, it, the whole message is going to flop, and I'm going to blame you if you don't participate. So uh, when I go home today and my wife says, how'd you do? If you don't do good now, I'm going to say, oh, uh, I did good, but they did terrible. All right. So let me ask you a question. I, I've been in ministry now for 42 years total, 30, 30 at Lakewood and, and others before. What would you suggest or what would you guess would be the number one question that I faced in 42 years? Just, just what, what comes to mind? What do you think people come into my office over 42 years and have asked me? What would it be? How did you do it? That's a good question. How much do you make? Okay. <laughs> Why? Why do things happen? Why especially do bad things happen to good people? What else? Come on, you got more than that. If you're going to walk into your pastor's office and ask him something, what would you ask him? How you doing? Okay. A little, a little deeper. Okay, why did you choose to come? All right. That's a big question. Heard that many times. Yeah. Oh, did you read the outline? <laughs> In 42 years of ministry, I've had all the questions. How do you be saved? How do you hear God speak? How do you know that you're a Christian? You know, uh, why do bad things happen to good people? Why did my baby die? I mean, I've had all kinds of questions. But the number one question I've had is, hey, pastor, what does God want me to do? What is God's will for my life? I've, I've heard that question asked by numerous people, not just young people. What is God's will for my life? What should I do? Well, I want you to notice first, and and there's a reason for this text, so follow me now. But in 1 Corinthians 13, that is the love chapter, right? That's the chapter that speaks about what is love. Are you with me? And Paul says in that passage, as we read, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I reasoned as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, Paul is talking in this text about immaturity. Are you with me? He's talking about immaturity. When I was a child, I acted like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So the text is about immaturity. Now, he uses the topic of love to make his point because he comes back and says, like, for instance, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, it's not boastful, it's never arrogant, it's not rude, it doesn't insist on its own way. See, he uses the topic of love to explain immaturity. In other words, he says, there are too many of you who are loving in an immature way. It's kind of like the difference between love and lust. See, love can't wait to give. Lust can't wait to get. It's an immature view of love. So with that context in mind, I want you to think about this. 
one of the most important things that you could do in moving toward maturity in Christ. One of, one, one of the biggest things you could do in moving toward maturity in Christ is to realize that who I am will have a bigger impact on my future and my legacy than what I do. See, that, that, that's a sign of maturity. When you come to realize that it's not the most important thing as to what you do. You see, what we, what we find from this text in Matthew, but seek first his kingdom, we find an order. And, and we are being reminded that what God wants you to do, first he wants you to be. See, let, let me just say this to you. When people come into my office and ask me, hey, preacher, what does God want me to do? What is God's will for my life? That's really the second question. The first question should be, what does God want me to be? You see, I don't know exactly what God wants you to do. He might want you to be a plumber or a carpenter or a business person or an Indian chief. I don't know what God wants you to do, but I can tell you what God wants you to be. And you got to get the B right. And yet so many of us focus all on the do. So let's just think for a moment today. Let's grow up in Christ a little bit and realize that what God wants me to be will carry far more greater legacy than anything I'd ever do. For instance, if you notice in your Bibles and on your outlines, Proverbs 10, 29. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to those with integrity. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to those with integrity. Now, I don't know what God wants you to do, but I can tell you what he wants you to be. He wants you to be a person of integrity. And you say, well, well like, what is integrity? Well, I bet you've heard the definition before, but it's the simplest one I know, and that is that choosing to do the right thing even when no one is looking, that's integrity. That we can do the right thing when no one is looking, that's a sign of integrity. Matthew Henry said it like this. He said, living with integrity makes you better fitted for service and suffering. When you become a person of integrity, when you live as a person of integrity, you are best fitted for both suffering and also for service. When you choose to live with integrity, the Bible says the way of the Lord becomes a stronghold for you. In other words, when you live with integrity, you have both blessing and protection from God. Integrity. Now, some people ask, well, how, how do you know if you're on track with integrity? Like, how do, how do you know? Because the world can be, you can be fooled and deceived. Well, one little motto that I read many years ago has helped me stay on track with this, and that is that seldom is the right thing the easy thing or the easy thing the right thing. That's a pretty good sign of integrity right there. When, when you think about being a person of integrity, just remember, seldom is the right thing the easy thing or the easy thing the right thing. Integrity is hard, but it makes a difference. I don't know what God wants you to do. He may want you to work at McDonald's or Burger King or a plumber or a carpenter or a doctor or a brain surgeon. I don't know what God wants you to do, but I can tell you he wants you to be a person of integrity, a person of honor. That matters. Integrity. Secondly, look at 1 Corinthians 16. 
the Bible says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. What does God want you to be? He wants you to be a person of integrity, and he wants you to be a person of courage. Courage. Let me ask you a question. Would you like people to use the word courage in describing you? Like if someone didn't know you and someone was telling someone else about you, would you like for them to use the word courage, courageous? I think most of us would. He's a courageous person. She's a person of courage. You see, God wants us to be people of courage. That's why he says, stand guard, be firm, be courageous. Now, I wish I could tell you there was a one, two, three step or a simple formula or some recipe in becoming courageous. It, it's just not there. There's no recipe to it. Um, however, I will tell you that courage comes over the years as God shapes you through the experiences that he gives you. See, the bottom line is life isn't always fair. Life isn't always easy. Life doesn't always go right. And as we experience these various things in our lives that are hurtful and sometimes scar us and sometimes embarrass us and sometimes are hard on us, as we, as we occur, as all that occurs in our life, as all these experiences come our way, the way we deal with that and handle that builds courage in our life and strength. You see, there's not a simple formula, but Paul is referring to both mental strength and physical strength and, or, or, or spiritual strength when he talks about this way to live. It's a, it's, a, it's a way to live. Live with courage. And there are a lot of examples of courage. I mean, how many do you know in the Bible? Joshua, Daniel, Rahab, Esther. So, so many. I would encourage you to do a little Bible study your own, your own and just look up some of these men and women of courage and read about them. See, I don't know what God wants you to do but I can tell you he wants you to be a person of courage. And I tell the young people that I talk to often, I say, you know, most of the time what that means is you say no when everyone else says yes, or you say yes when everyone else says no. You've got to be a person of courage. This was Paul's word to the church, to the early church. Be courageous in your faith. Be courageous in your relationships. Be courageous in your decisions. Be courageous in your core values and your principles. Be courageous. Stand for something. Stand for what God's word approves. Many years ago, you probably remember reading about this, the governing body of the Anglican Church in Vancouver, Canada, voted to authorize services to to bless same-sex unions. J.I. Packer, who was a scholar, theologian, pastor, author. Some of you have his book entitled Knowing God. It's a classic. You should read it if you haven't. J.I. Packer stood up in that assembly in protest and walked out of the meeting when this motion came to the floor. Later, when he was asked why he did that, why did I walk out? He said, because this decision, taken in its context, falsifies the gospel of Christ, abandons the authority of Scripture, jeopardizes the salvation of fellow human beings, and betrays the church in its God-appointed role as defender of divine truth. He was ostracized. He was criticized for his stance. Later, 
he wrote when he would not relent. Asking God to sanctify sin by blessing what he condemns is irresponsible, irreverent, and blasphemous. It's completely unacceptable as a church policy, and I will not do it, J.I. Packer. Now, how much courage do you think that took? To stand up in an assembly and be the lone voice crying in the wilderness and say, I will not do it. You see, that's what we need in the boardroom today, and that's what we need in the classroom today, and that's what we need in the homeroom today, and that's what we need in the living room today. We need men and women of courage who believe God's Word, who stand on God's Word, and who won't back down from God's Word. See, I don't know what God wants you to do. Go do something. But I can tell you what He wants you to be. He wants you to be courageous. I tell you, one day we will all stand before God and give an account. And this is why I urge people all the time, Live for an audience of one. Don't live to please the crowd. Live for an audience of one. Be courageous. Now, as you go about being courageous, I would remind you of what the Bible says in Galatians. The Bible says that we are to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. One of the best compliments anyone ever gave to me was uh, many, many years ago, they said, you know, you know what I like about you is that you don't mind saying the truth, but you don't say it like you're mad at anybody. And there's no need to be mad at anybody. Listen, you don't need to be mad at anybody. That's not your role to be mad at anybody. Your role is to speak the truth in love. God hasn't called you to persuade. He's called you to proclaim. Speak the truth in love. Your role is not to persuade. That's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit will do the persuading. You and I are called to be courageous in our proclaiming. Speak the truth in love. Be courageous. When something is wrong, speak it. When something goes against clearly God's Word, speak it. Be a person of integrity. Live it. Be a person of courage. Support it. See, I don't know what God wants you to do but I can tell you what he wants you to be. The final thought I'll give to you today is, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. That, that's a passage I'm sure you're familiar with. Maybe not in this context, but one that you're familiar with. Paul said to a young pastor, his name was Timothy. Timothy was probably less than 20 at this time. He was probably less than 18. And he was left in charge of a church that Paul had founded and as Paul was leaving, he called Timothy to him and he said, okay, Timothy, here's the deal. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers. Set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, and in purity. In other words, Timothy, be a person of influence. Use your life to influence. Now, I know when some of you hear the word influence, you say, ah, oh, I don't have any influence. Nobody listens to me. No, nobody pays any attention to me. I, I, I don't have any. That You're wrong. You, you are a person of influence. You have influence over somebody. Now, some of you may have influence over many people. Others of you may have influence over a smaller number of people. But you have some degree of influence. 
And I can tell you what God wants you to do with it. He wants you to use it for His kingdom. See, be a person of influence and impact those who are around you. Listen, when I was um, 18 or 19 years old, I went to college for the first time. Didn't really want to be there. Had a chip on my shoulder. And as I was somehow or another, just by God's providence, I was placed in the athletic kind of suite or dorm. I, I certainly wasn't an athlete. But God's providence put me in that particular room. And in that suite, in that little dorm room, was another young man, 17, 18 years old. His name was Jeff Hughes. And Jeff was about, I don't know, what, 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, he weighed about 95 pounds. And he played basketball. He, he was there on basketball scholarship. I'd never met him, didn't know him. But as I walked by his room, I would see him often kneeling at his bed praying. Sometimes I would find him at his desk reading the Bible. When everyone else was going out on the town, so to speak, as much as there was in Vidalia, Georgia, Jeff was getting ready to go to college group at First Baptist Church, Vidalia. And Jeff would often ask me to go with him. And many times I would say, no, not interested. He, he never gave up. He never quit. He, he, ne he didn't relent. He just kept, he, he lived before me, my sight, a life of a Christian. And it, it inspired me. It impressed me. And not too long after that, I began joining him, being with him. And his confidence in the Lord and, and his strength in the Lord and his determination in the Lord inspired me, and I became better. And Jeff has heard me say this many times. I've told him, I would not be the person I am today if it were not for Jeff Hughes then. Jeff Hughes used his influence on me. Now, what if he had used it in another way? We might both be in jail today, right? But he had a little influence, and he used it on me, and it made an impact in my life. Let me ask you, who are some of the people who have impacted your life. Can you go back years and years and years and years ago? Was it a, was, who was some of those people that impacted your life? Use their influence on you. You're part of the person who you are today because of them. See, listen, I don't know what God wants you to do, but I can tell you what He wants you to be. He wants you to be a person of influence influence for his kingdom for his purpose you can do that if you put yourself out of the way if you get yourself out of the way if you get your agenda out of the way if you get your likes and your dislikes out of the way and if you just start trying to live your life to impact and improve the life of another paul said to timothy don't don't let anyone look down on you no, no, no. Use as an example to others your speech, your conduct, your love. You see it. Your faith, your purity. Use those things to set an example for others. Here's a question you should consider. It's not so much, did I have a Jeff Hughes? The question you should consider today is, who's Jeff Hughes am I? That's the question you ought to be asking yourself. Who's Jeff Hughes am I? One day we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to give an account of our life. And He's going to ask us to explain how we live as people of influence, as people of courage, as people of integrity. Remember, Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? 
Don't follow the wrong things. So what does God want you to do? I, I don't know. I mean, if I spent some time with you, I suppose we could take some tests or, you know, I, I give you a psychological exam, I reckon. And we could kind of figure out what your gifts are and what your passion is and what your heart is and how God shaped you. I mean, we could look at some of that and begin to figure out. But I can tell you immediately what God wants you to be. He wants you to be a person of integrity. He wants you to be a person of courage. And he wants you to be a person of influence. Now, I'll finish, by, but i got to say, okay, well, how, because I always hate it when preachers tell you what to do and don't tell you how to do it, right? So how, how do you live like, 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 how do you build that into your life? I mean, it's hard. It's hard. Well, for me, um, I can tell you, this is for me. Now, how it works for you, you have to determine that and discern that from the Lord. But for me, it has been, I have adopted into my life some sustaining scriptures. I mean, these are scriptures that, that are very, very important to me. I've, I've had them for many, many years. And when I begin to waver, I begin to fail, or I, 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 I automatically think of these three scriptures specifically. The first one, you notice on your outline, is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your path. See, I've had that sustaining Scripture for decades. You know why? Because I don't know the answers to all those questions you were asking. I don't know why that baby died that I had to bury. I don't know why that spouse died prematurely and left three children and a spouse. I don't know why you got fired from your job. I don't know why you have a health difficulty today. I See, as a young pastor, I, I tried to answer all those questions, but as I, as I became older, I realized I couldn't answer them. But what I could know is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. See, I know that. I know that. I don't know all the whys and therefores, but I know that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. I know that. That's been with me for years and years and years. I have relied on that passage for years and years and years. The second one you'll notice in your outline is 1 Peter 2.15. This is what I call my life passage. 1 Peter 2.15, God gave this to me about 40 years ago. I could take you to the place where He gave it to me. I was in a tough spot. I was a young pastor, 20-something years old, trying to figure it out, about to give up, about to quit, about to throw in the towel. And God gave me this verse, 1 Peter 2.15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you put to silence the foolish talk of ignorant men. 1 Peter 2.15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you put to silence the ignorant, the foolish talk of ignorant men. See, I was having a difficulty at that particular moment in my life where I was more focused on what people thought and were saying than on what I was doing. And the Lord gave me this word. He said, Smiley, you've got to quit worrying about what people are saying. And you just got to keep doing what I've called you to do. 1 Peter 2.15, my life verse. And then the final one is Job 13.15 because I love this verse because by nature I am a stubborn person. I mean, I am a loyal, stubborn 
person. And uh, this is why I love Job. He, I think he was a little stubborn. And Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. See, so for me, the way that I've kind of tried to maintain this life of, of integrity and courage and influence, and, and I haven't always succeeded. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, quite, it's a journey, right? Nobody's perfect with it. But what's helped me kind of stay on track has been these three verses in my life. Now, I don't know what your verses would be. You need to find, you, these aren't my verses, so you're welcome to use them, but I would suggest you find your own. Okay, you're welcome to use them. I didn't write them. But, and if you want them, use them. But I would encourage you first to do a little journey through the Bible and as you read, begin to mark scriptures and outline scriptures and highlight scriptures. And after a while, you'll, be, you, you'll get a sense of what a scripture is speaking to you about. But for me, that's how I've kind of stepped, stayed in line. You need the sustaining scriptures. God's word is powerful. God's word is perfect. There is no error, no mistake with God's word. No contradiction in God's word. It is beautiful. It is powerful. It is meaningful. And it can help sustain you in your journey as a Christ follower. But you have to read it. And you have to know it. So today, I can tell you that your legacy, and I'm a grandfather of six, between the ages of four and ten, and I can tell you, I, I, I'm thinking a lot about legacy. Let, let me just remind you, according to God's Word, your legacy is more dependent on not so much what you do, but how you live. My grandchildren, some of them probably won't even know that I was a preacher. They, three of them has hardly ever heard me preach. Because I've retired, they became really of age to know that. See, I don't know what God wants you to do. But with your grandchildren and your children and your spouse and your co-workers and your church friends, I can tell you what he wants you to be. He wants you to be a person of integrity. He wants you to be a person of courage. And he wants you to be a person of influence. Now, if you get that right, you'll get the doing right. May God bless you as you live your journey with Christ Jesus, our Lord.